Hey everyone, this is a piece titled On the Notion of, quote, Workers' Control, end quote, in Marx and Marxists, 1871 to 1917, a survey by Babak Amini. One, on the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote. The notion of, quote, workers' control has been used to cover a wide range of phenomenon from limited workers' supervision of working conditions to full workers' management of the social relations of production. It has also been deployed within a broader <clears throat> within a broad ideological spectrum, including Marxism, anarcho-syndicalism, guild socialism, and social democracy. <clears throat> Footnote. For diversity on the notion among the various schools of thought, see Emanuel Ness and Dario Azzolini, edited, edited volume, Ours to Master and to Own, Workers' Control from the Commune to the Present. Dario Azzelli, as, excuse me, Azzolini and Michael Kraft, The Class Strikes Back, Self-Organized Worker Struggles in the 21st Century. Maximilien Rubel and John Crump, Non-Market Socialism in the 19th and 20th Centuries, Catherine Mulder, Transcending Capitalism Through Cooperative Practices, Bernard Shaw's Fabian Essays, George K. Dow, Governing the Firm, Workers' Control in Theory and Practice, and that's it, <laughs> and footnote. Therefore, it is by no means limited to Marxism. In fact, Marxism has always had an uneasy relationship with this notion, either for its ideological flexibilities that could facilitate as much an anti-political radical left stance as a class collaborationist liberal position, or for its conceptual antagonism with much of the actual 20th century socialist systems. It is in the latter sense, in opposition to the most hegemonic forms of Marxism in the 20th century, that the notion is utilized in this chapter to trace the conceptual genesis of a vision of communist society based on Marx's notion of a society of, quote, free and associated producers, end quote. Footnote, Marx's Theories of Surplus Value, Part 3. End footnote. Some might take an issue with such a radical interpretation of the idea of workers' control whose common use in theory and practice has far less revolutionary criteria. One can argue in response that for workers to have an actual control over the relations of production, which goes beyond the limits of the sphere of production, they must break from not only capital towards socialization of the means of production, but also the state towards the associated administration of society. Footnote. For example, see Paul Maddox, Workers' Control in Anti-Bolshevik Communism. End footnote. Workers remain under the spur of capital and its market, imp market imperatives, even if they are given supervisory or participatory rights. Workers remain subject to the will of bureaucratic organs of the centralized state even if they are formally in control of the means of production. In emphasizing the, quote, workers' control, end quote, it seeks to make a distinction with the division of the future society based on the state or the party control. Therefore, this chapter surveys the theoretical manifestations of a concept defined a priori rather than the evolution of the notion employed a posteriori through concrete experiences. The temporal boundary adapted in this essay, or should be adopted, wait, I don't know, maybe it's not, I don't know. Temporal boundary, the temporal boundary adapted in this essay is from 1871, when Marx published his reflections on the Paris Commune in Civil War in France to just before the February Revolution of 1917. There are more reasons behind this deliberation beyond space considerations. Although the genesis of the concept can certainly be found in earlier writings of Marx, such as the Grundrisse and Capital Volume 1, The Experience of the Paris Commune in 1871, 
invoked new ideas in Marx about the organization of the post-capitalist society. Conversely, the experience of the February Revolution had profound effects on Marxist theorists on the political form of the revolutionary transition and the nature of socialist society. It is precisely the exclusion of the effects of this momentous event from the inquiry that helps to highlight its transformative effects on Marxist thoughts on classical Marxism and beyond. The chapter illustrates the extent to which the idea of, quote, workers control, end quote, finds expression in Marx and some of the Marxist theorists between 1871 and the February Revolution. Needless to say, not all Marxist thinkers of this period and not all of their writings could be analyzed within the confines of this chapter. Therefore, it is not a comprehensive survey, even within the chosen period. Its hope, nevertheless, is to at least provide a ground for further investigation. However, certain peculiarities surface from the selection, suggesting that the most, quote, prominent, end quote, Marxist theorists of this period did not, in fact, have as much so, have as much to say about the notion of, quote, workers' control, end quote, as, a, as compared to more, quote, marginal, end quote, figures. Reasons behind this and the need to re-examine Marx's writings on this notion are discussed in the concluding section. The major themes that emerge from the survey resolve around the centrality of self-emancipation of the working class to democratically control the socialized means of production through federations of associated producers. This implies that the question of the state and the state's role in such revolutionary transformation looms large in these accounts. Some theorists, especially Marx and Engels, were also keenly aware of the fact that such a realm of freedom is unattainable as long as capitalist market imperatives are left in place. Brief remar remarks on the historical context. The different takes and emphasis on the notion of workers' control that we will see should be proximately understood in terms of the varieties of political contexts that demanded different theoretical struggles, two underlying historical trends, one general to the period and the other particular to the national context, can be recognized. In, excuse me, it was in this period that, I'm sorry, I'm going to be an asshole right now, this, this this piece needed a uh, needed a proofread in terms of it was in this period that socialist parties emerged and especially in continental europe gained traction towards becoming mass parties footnote see dick geary his edit edited volume labor and socialist movements in europe before 1914 published in 1989 and jeff ellie Forging Democracy, the History of the Left in Europe, 1850-2000. to 2000. Although they faced serious hurdles in translating their mass support into political power due to electoral disenfranchisement and state repression, the rapid expansion of the working class provided the social force behind these parties. In the meanwhile, this period saw the growth of the union movement, which was not always in sync with the socialist movement in either ideological orientation or organizational domination. Footnote. See Donald Sassoon, 100 Years of Socialism, the West European Left in, 20th, in the 20th Century. Stefano Bartolini, The Political Mobilization of the European Left. 1860-1890, The Class Cleavage, published in 2000, Ira Katznelson and Aristide R. Solberg, edited volume, Working Class Formation, 19th Century Patterns in Western Europe and the United States, published by Princeton University Press in 1986. End footnote. Marxism had its own trajectory in this period, which, albeit rapidly becoming one of the most dominant theoretical orientations among the radicals, had by no means remained unchallenged. 
the gulf that erupted within the International Working Men's Association between the anarchists and Marxists continued to widen for the next four decades. Footnote. See Marcelo Musto's Introduction in Workers Unite, the International 150 Years Later, edited by Marcelo Musto. I really recommend that book myself because it has a lot of primary source documents about that of um, participants in the International. Um, end footnote. Anarchist thought continued to play a major influence on radical thinkers, especially in Russia, France, and the Southern European countries. Footnote. See David Barry and Constance Bantman's edited volume, New Perspectives on Anarchism, Labor and Syndicalism, the Individual, the National, and the Transnational. Also, Peter H. Marshall is demanding the impossible, a history of anarchism, especially part five. Um, if I was uh, to make a suggestion to your to your reading, as opposed because I've have not read the New Perspectives one, but I have read Demanding the Impossible, and in terms of histories of anarchism, I personally found, um, although it's not written by an academic, um. Uh, the book The Idea by Nick Heath, which is a history of anarchist communism. And so it was a little more uh, specific. Um, obviously, anarchist communism is not the only form of anarchism, but uh, it's a, it tries to situate anarchism as a response to the social question as it develops in the 19th century, as opposed to, like, a lot of anarchist, uh, anarchist histories, like the one by Peter Marshall, which tries to, like, you know, find anarchism as, like, a sort of, like, trans-historical thread uh, throughout history. So, like, you know, going into, like, Taoism and things like that and the anarchist moments of that, which, of course, is interesting, but it's kind of, it kind of, according to Nick Heath, and I think this is a very interesting and, I think, correct point, is that, uh, this kind of um, turns anarchism into an a more and to like an ahistorical um, attitude, as opposed to a specific uh, political project um, with concrete goals um, for what it wants to see uh, modern civilization become. Um, so I'd really recommend that book. Um, a lot, especially if you're trying to look into like where anarchism as a form of socialism and not just a form, of, not just like a philosophy has manifested itself, um, theoretically and politically in different parts of the world. You know, if you're interested in say, you know, Chinese anarchism and its relation to, uh, the mainstream, uh, communist and nationalist movements in China. I would really recommend checking out Nick Heath's book, The Idea. Very good. Very good stuff. Anarchist or whether or not you would call yourself an anarchist or not, you should read that book if you're trying to get a very get like a good feel for um some of the tenets of anarchist communism. Tenets. Not tenets. I always want to say tenets. Tenets. Um Okay, so back to the Essay. Therefore, Marxist theoreticians felt obliged to clearly distinguish themselves, sometimes even at the cost of rejecting some positive aspects of anarchist thoughts. Another development that concerned Marxists, particularly until the end of the 1900s, was the significant shift within the labor movement towards syndicalism. Footnote. See Marcel van der Linden and Wayne Thorpe's Revolutionary Syndicalism, an International Perspective. Um, I can't find a PDF of that book, so I'm like, I would, I would like to read that, though. Um, I really recommend Marcel van der Linden's uh, essay on council communism and his essay on socialisme ou barbarie. And I would also recommend, of course, which is um, a, a, a very, very fascinating book, uh, Western Marxism and the Soviet Union. I would recommend everyone read that. Um, it's a great book. 
uh, Marcel Van, Van der Linen's done some interesting shit in his life. Because there's a, um, I read like the last chapter in this book that's like a, um, I don't fucking know what they're called. Um, it's like a, it's like, you know, it's like a German tradition of making an edited volume and dedication to a living figure. There was one, uh, done, um, for Marcel van der Linden by Karl Heinz Roth, who I think is a kind of like steeped in like the German tradition of autonomism. I don't know. But he wrote, there's a sight shift. I think this is a sight shift. No, it's not there. But, um, yeah, in his essay, uh, you know, he really gave me a, a very deep, in like the last essay of the book is like a kind of like an intellectual biography of Marcel van der Linden. And it's, uh, his uh, scholarly accomplishments are very, very uh, impressive. Dude seems like he has a lot of energy. <laughs> All right. And footnote. There were specific trends within each country that strongly influenced the native theoretical development. It was only in Germany that Marxism became the official doctrine of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, a party that enjoyed an exceptional hegemony within the left and unparalleled organizational capacity which soon translated into parliamentary strength. The party was also responsible for the establishment of the Union and therefore had a close relationship with the Union, albeit not without tensions, especially later in the 1900s. In France, there was a strong presence of Proudhonism and Blanquism until the end of the 1890s, and then the continued influence of anarchism and syndicalism within the socialist and labor movement into the 20th century. Therefore, the French Marxists had to carve a space within these ideologies, which often involved leveraging on the deep-seated anarcho-syndicalist sensibilities of the French working class. In the United Kingdom, the hegemony of reformism within the labor movement, which gave rise to the Labour Party, left little room for radical socialist tendencies. The Irish situation, although under the influence of British socialism, had more room for radicalism insofar as it could be linked to the project of independence. It should not come as a surprise that the Marxist intellectuals in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Ireland gravitated towards the breathing space that was created after the emergence of the industrial workers of the world, the IWW. Russia was a profoundly different case, given the weakness of the social base due to the level of industrialization and the autocratic absolutist state, the most pressing challenge of the Russian socialists appeared to be the democratization of the state to create political space for reforms. However, the Tsar regime proved itself incapable of undergoing any democratic reform. The process of proletari proletariat says proletarization. I don't think that's correct, but the process of proletarianization of the population intensified exponentially after the outbreak of World War I. But the state clamped down on the political agitation and socialist parties' capitulation to the imperialist project in the hope of finding a stronger foothold in the sphere of formal politics substantially interrupted the radical project within the socialist camp. Footnote. See... In Antoine or Antoine Prost, workers in the Cambridge History of the First World War, edited by J. Winter, published in 2014 by Cambridge University Press. End footnote. Furthermore, the imperial rivalry in the lead-up to and the disastrous consequences of the war presented Marxist intellectuals with new questions to grapple with. This is why there is no text in the survey that was published during the war. Section 3. Workers' Control in Marx and the Early Marxists. Karl Marx, 1818-1883. There is much in Marx's work prior to 1871 that speaks to the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote. However, the developments within the International Working Men's Association and the Paris Commune had profound effects on his conception of the form of, of future society. 
In the general rules of the International Working Men's Association, originally written in 1864 but updated in 1871, Marx and Engels restate the fundamental motto of the International, quote, that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, dot, 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 bracket, end, end bracket, that the economical emancipation of the working classes is, therefore, the great end to which every political movement ought to be subordinated as a means, end quote. Footnote. Marx and Friedrich Engels, General Rules of the International Working Men's Association in Workers Unite. And footnote. As Marx and Engels said repeatedly on numerous occasions, which what mattered was that, quote, the emancipation of the working class must be achieved by working by the working class itself. Hence we, bracket, in the workers' party, end bracket, cannot cooperate with men who say openly that the workers are too uneducated to emancipate themselves and must first be emancipated from above by philanthropic members of the upper and lower middle class. End quote. Marx and Engels in Circular Letter to August Babel, Wilhelm Liebknecht, Wilhelm Brucke, and others. Marx Engels Collected Works 24. End footnote. They also caution strongly against allowing the leadership of the working class party to fall into the hands of such an element. They told they held on uncompromisingly to this principle. Albeit the subordination of the political movement to the economic emancipation, they put utmost emphasis on the importance of, quote, the conquest of political power, end quote, as the, quote, great duty of the working class, end quote. Marx and Engels, General Rules of the International Working Men's Association. They also underscored the fact that the working class cannot collectively engage in such political actions, quote, except by constituting itself into a political party distinct from and opposed to all old parties formed by the propertied classes, end quote. Therefore, Marx's idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote, is far from an anarcho-syndicalist understanding. It sees the construction of political parties as, quote, indispensable, end quote, to quote the triumph of social revolution, end quote, even though political movement remains instrumentally subordinate to the ultimate end of the economic emancipation of the working class by the working class itself. Um, according to Nick Heath, um, in terms of anarchism, and I suppose this is maybe what distinguishes anarchist communism from anarchist syndicalism to some extent, is that the anarchist communists um, believe in something akin to, or at least portions of them, believe in something akin to a party, though not like a substitutionist or a parliamentary party. Which I guess parliamentary party would be a form of substitutionist party. They further believe that the working class must use its forces in economic struggles as, quote, a lever for its struggle against the political power of landlords and capitalists, end quote. Marx and Engels on the political action of the working class and other matters. In other words, quote, in the militant state of the working class, its economical movement and its political action are indissolubly united, end quote. In his Civil War in France, 1871, Marx analyzed the emergence and the development of the Paris Commune and assessed the Paris Commune's theoretical implications. Marx argued that the Paris Commune showed that, quote, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield the ready-made state machinery for the working class's own purposes, end quote. 
This is because the structure of the modern state has been formed through the modern state's historical evolution due to both political class struggle of classes and class fractions and economic changes in society in ways that the state power and its organs reflect the capitalist social relation. The commune was, quote, the direct antithesis of the bracket second and bracket empire, end quote, that sought to supersede not only the form of a particular class character of the state, but, quote, class rule itself, end quote, which required a fundamental transformation of the state and the state's key organs, such as the army, the po- the po- the- this is uh, the policy, I guess it's the police, I don't know, as the army, the policy, the government, the educational institutions, and the judiciary. At the core of such transformation lay one fundamental principle, to create the, quote, basis of really democratic institutions, end quote. Quote, while the merely repressive organs of the old government power, governmental power were to be amputated, its legitimate functions were to be wrested from an authority usurping preeminence over society itself and restored to the responsible agents of society, end quote. The, quote, expansive political form, end quote, of government that the commune sought to establish was, quote, local municipal liberty, end quote. But this transformation could not be limited to the political sphere. Marx believed that the commune, quote, as essentially a working class government, bracket is, end bracket, the produce of the struggle of the producing against the appropriating class, end quote. Hence, the political form that the commune sought to establish could, quote, serve as a lever for uprooting the economical foundations upon which rests the existence of classes and therefore of class rule, end quote. This implied the transformation of private property into, quote, mere instruments of free and associated labor, end quote. Such a cooperative society of free and associated producers whose vision had to be, quote, emphatically international, end quote, what Marx simply identified as, quote, communism, end quote, was to, quote, regulate national production upon a common plan, thus taking it under their own control, end quote. Um, this is just a side. Uh, on the same day that I'm reading this, I read um, a history of economic planning in the Soviet Union between 1917 and uh, the pre, uh, just up to the prior to the uh, Second World War. And one of the things that is, I was, was like kind of struck me while I was reading it was the emphasis on how like secretive the Goss plan was. The Goss plan being like the uh, planning commission of the Soviet state and how um, not only was it top down and had no democratic features whatsoever, um, its activities were highly secretive from like the population at large. There was no kind of like um, the freedom of information or freedom of ideas in the sense of like uh, open and clear communication uh, between actors within the economy. Nothing. So it was very interesting how uh, that kind of like forestalled the, the secrecy, the sheer um, non-transparency of the uh, the plan to the people who the plan who were executing the plan, um, what a prominent feature of Soviet economic life that was. And so the idea of this, you know, this notion that, you know, I've read this a couple of times, you know, I've read the, the basics of, you know, a fair deal of commentaries about what Marx and Engels uh, meant, uh, how they conceptualized the socialist and communist societies, which for them are the same things with different <clears throat> levels of, uh, with different, um, degrees of development, and I've seen this common plan now, but I'm the, just reading it again, I've seen this common plan, you know, the notion of the common plan before, but the idea that, um, the idea of planning in Marx and Engels necessarily being something that's, like, commonly undertaken by the producers in a transparent and, and uh, 
non-opaque fashion is something that fundamentally did not transpire in the Soviet Union right out the gate. Um, so that was just a thought I had while I was reading today. So I don't know when I'll upload this video. It might be uh, before or after that one. But if you're interested, Mark Harrison, he has a YouTube channel. He has a YouTube lecture. I think he might be like kind of like a conservative guy or like a, I don't know, or maybe not, maybe just like a, you know, liberal or social democrat he's definitely not definitely not a marxist of any kind i don't think um although i could have sworn i've seen writings of his in radical magazines but i'm not like in the 80s or something like that but i'm not entirely sure but um his history of his his historical work on the economic history of the soviet union is very interesting at least that article was and the youtube lecture that he has on the internet um Anyway, sorry. Further elaboration of Marx's radical understanding of, quote, workers' control, end quote, appears in Critique of the Gotha Program from 1875, in which Marx offered a sharp critique of the draft of the program of the Socialist Workers' Party of Germany. In response to the demand for state-assisted cooperatives under the democratic control of workers, Marx argued that, quote, instead of arising from the revolutionary process of the transformation of society, the, quote, socialist organization of the total labor, end quote, or, quote, arises, end quote, from the, quote, state aid, end quote, that the state gives to the producers' cooperative societies, which the state, not the worker, quote, calls into being, end quote, end quote. Karl Marx, Marginal Notes on the Program of the German Workers' Party. Marx believes such a scheme could not lead to a revolutionary transformation of the capitalist social relation, Marx further questioned the seemingly democratic appeal of the demand. What does, quote, control of the working people by the rule of the people, end quote, mean? And particularly in the case of working people who, through these demands that the, the working people put to the state, express their full consciousness that they neither rule nor are right for rule, end quote. Therefore, creation of the conditions for a cooperative society to transcend the capitalist social relation of production was only valuable, Marx argued, quote, only insofar as they are the independent creations of the workers and not protégés either of the governments or of the bourgeoisie, end quote. Through such a critique, Marx emphasized the need for achieving an actual rather than a formal control by workers. Regarding the question of the transformation of the state in a communist society, Marx wrote here that in the period of political transition from capitalism to communism, the state undergoes a phase that, quote, can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. Footnote. This phrase has been notoriously abused by later Marxists, even though Marx himself rarely used it throughout his corpus. End footnote. We must note that this was a critique of Lasallian socialism that, quote, treated the state rather as an independent entity that possesses its own, quote, intellectual, ethical, and libertarian bases, end quote, end quote. Marx. Marx qualified the notion of the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, in his Notes on Bakunin's Statehood and Anarchy, 1874 to 1875, where Marx responded to the charges that Mikhail Bakunin made against him. The notion, quote, implies that as long as the other classes, above all the capitalist class, still exist, and as long as the proletariat is still fighting against it, for when the proletariat obtains control of, of the government, its enemies and the old organization of society will not yet have disappeared. It must use forcible means, that is to say, governmental means, end quote. Marx. Therefore, the proletariat must use the power of the state to accelerate the process of transforming the economic condition that constitute it, constitutes it as a class, so as to abolish, quote, 
its own character as wage labor and hence as a class, end quote. In response to Bakunin's rhetorical question as to whether the whole of the proletariat can stand at the head of the government, Marx said, quote, certainly, for the system starts with the self-government of the communities, end quote. In Capital Volume 3, Marx began a discussion about the supervisory and managerial role of a general acknowledgement that it, quote, arises where the direct production process takes the form of a socially combined process and does not appear simply as the isolated labor of separated producers, end quote. Therefore, it emerges in two forms as an organizational necessity of, quote, any combined mode of production, end quote, in general, but also in all modes of production where there is an opposition between the direct pr director producers, excuse me, the direct producers and the owners of the means of production, end quote. What is specific about work of supervision and management under capitalism is that it is, quote, directly and inseparably fused with the productive functions that all combined social labor assigns to particular individuals as their special work, end quote. The infusion implies that the work of supervision does not necessarily have to be performed by the capitalist, just as the capitalist can become, quote, superfluous as a functionary in production, end quote. Marx referred to the cooperative factories as a proof of this superfluidity, superfluidity whose conditions of possibility emerge as a at a certain stage of the development of capitalism. A crucial difference is that, quote, in the case of a cooperative factory, the antithetical character of the supervisory work disappears. Since the manager is paid by the workers instead of representing capital in opposition to them, end quote. Nevertheless, quote, the cooperative factories run by workers themselves are within the old form, the first example of the emergence of a new form, even though they naturally reproduce in all cases in their present organization all the defects of the existing system and must reproduce them, end quote. Marx. For Marx, freedom in the realm of natural necessity, quote, can consist only in this, that socialized man, the associated producers, govern the human metabolism with nature in a rational way, bringing the human metabolism with nature under their collective control instead of being dominated by their metabolism with nature as a blind power accomplishing their metabolism with nature with the least expenditure of energy and in conditions most worthy and appropriate for their human nature. But this always remains a realm of necessity, the true realm of freedom, the development of human powers as an end in itself, begins beyond it, though it can only flourish with this realm of necessity as its basis, end quote. Marx. The true realm of freedom cannot be achieved unless the realm of necessity falls under the actual control of associated producers beyond mechanisms of economic or political domination. This cannot be accomplished within the wage system or through the market economy or on the basis of centralized state control. Footnote. Marx. Marginal Notes on the Program of the German Workers' Party and Marx Capital Volume 2. And footnote. This captures the essence of what Marx called a, quote, society of free and associated producers, end quote. Footnote. Marx Theories of Surplus Value, Part 3. Friedrich Engels, 1820-1895. Engels published a series of articles entitled The Housing Question, 
between 1872 and 1873 as a critical intervention in the debate about the housing shortage in major industrial cities. The text criticized the schemes proposed by Proudhonian and Lasallian socialists regarding the solution to the housing crisis as insufficient to transform the capitalist social relation and therefore to address the root cause of the problem. In the last part, he countered the Proudhonist, quote, redemption, end quote, scheme as characterized in Arthur Muhlberger's writings with respect to the seizure of the means of production. Footnote. Engels defined the Proudhonian notion of, quote, redemption, end quote, as follows. Quote, the abolition of rented dwellings is proclaimed a necessity and couched in the form of a demand that every tenant be turned into the owner of his dwelling, end quote. They proposed that this would be done by fully compensating the previous house owner and the occupants, i.e. the previous tenant, would continue to pay the equivalent amount of the previous rent annually to the society in return for the possession of the house. According to Muhlberger, as quoted by Engels, this entailed that, quote, society, dot, 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 transform itself in this way into a totality of free and independent owners of dwellings, end quote. End footnote. He argued the quote, so he argued that quote, quote, he argued that quote, the quote, actual Caesar, end quote, of all the instrument of labor, all the instruments of labor, the taking possession of the industry as a whole by the working people is the exact opposite of the Proudhonist, quote, redemption, end quote. In the latter case, the individual worker becomes the owner of dwelling, the personal farm, the instrument of labor. In the former case, the, quote, working people, end quote, remain the collective owner of the houses, factories, and instruments of labor, and will hardly permit their use, at least during a transitional period, by individuals or associations without compensation for the cost. In the same way, the abolition of property in land is not the abolition of ground rent, but its transfer, if in a modified form, to society. The actual seizure of all the instruments of labor by the working people, therefore, does not at all preclude the retention of rent relations, end quote. Some of the most substantive discussions relevant to the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote, in Engels in this period are found in part three of Anti-During, Herr, Der Herr Eugen During's Revolution in Science, published in 1878. Footnote. Part of the book, which includes much of the discussion presented here, was published separately in 1880 under the title Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. End footnote. Like Marx, Engels was adamant in his critique of Lasallian state socialism in using the existing state machinery to fundamentally transform the capitalist social relation. Footnote. Echoing Marx, Engels said in his preface to the 1888 English edition of Communist Manifesto that the political program of the manifesto, quote, has in some details become antiquated, end quote. This was because the experience of the Paris Commune has proven that, quote, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield the ready-made state machinery for its own purpose, end quote. Friedrich Engels, preface to the 1888 English edition of the Manifesto of the Communist Party. End footnote. Engels argued that, quote, the transformation either into joint stock companies or into state ownership does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces, dot, dot, dot. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine, the state of the capitalist, the ideal personification of the total national capital. The more it proceeds to the taking over of productive forces, the more the state more does the state actually become the national capitalist. The more citizens 
does the state exploit? The workers remain wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relation is not done away with. It is rather brought to a head, but brought to a head, it topples over, end quote. Friedrich Engels, anti during This is end footnote. This essentially rejects nationalization as a revolutionary strategy. However, the state ownership of productive forces does not offer a solution, quote, concealed within it are the technical conditions that form the elements of that solution, end quote. As for the solution, Engels wrote that it, quote, can only consist in the practical recognition of the social nature of the modern forces of production, and therefore in the harmonizing of the modes of production, appropriation, and exchange with the socialized character of the means of production. And this can only come about by society openly and directly taking possession of the productive forces which have outgrown all control except that of society as a whole, end quote. Engels. Therefore, the solution lies only through socialization of means of production in the sense of the society, not the, quote, state, end quote, having open and direct, not conditional or indirect control. It is within such an arrangement that, quote, at last, the real nature of the productive forces of today, the social anarchy of production, gives place to a social regulation of production upon a definite plan according to the needs of the community and of each individual, end quote. The notion of each individual seems important. Okay. Just thinking out loud. Note that Engels does, did not foresee a substitution of the social anarchy of production by a state-planned economy, but a socially regulated economy that is for the benefit not just of the community as a whole, but also of each individual. Regarding the revolutionary process of such a transformation, Engels wrote that, quote, the proletariat seizes political power and turns the means of production in the first instance into state property. But in doing this, it abolishes itself as a proletariat, abolishes all class distinctions and class antagonisms, abolishes also the state as state, end quote. Engels. However, contrary to those who interpreted this as validating a long transitional period in which the workers' state, in the workers' state capacity as the possessor of the means of production, remains until it, quote, naturally, end quote, withers away, it is crucial to note that Engels also stated that, quote, the first act by virtue of which the state really constitutes itself as the representative of, whole of, of the whole of society, the taking possession of the means of production in the name of society, this is at the same time its last independent act as state, end quote, Engels. It is hence its first and last act as a state after which its interference in the social relation becomes progressively superfluous until, quote, the government of persons is replaced by the administration of things, end quote. Afterwards, quote, now under the dominion and control of man, end quote, quote, the laws of his own social action, hitherto standing face to face with man as laws of nature foreign to it and dominating him, will then be used with full understanding and so be mastered by him, end quote. Um, I feel like sometimes when you hear about, like, Engels being, like, more positivistic than Marx, in terms of, like, viewing social laws as natural laws, I feel like that just, that past sentence that I just read is a sure as hell indication of that. Um, <clears throat> there's some kind of, uh, laws of, Nat natural laws of the economy that can simply need to be appropriated and put to use uh, politically 
for the interests of the working class seems like what was the content of what was just saying, as opposed to those saying um, there are these laws of, of human social action within capitalism that need to be overcome in order for human metabolism nature with human metabolism with nature to be self-consciously regulated by the direct producers um saying that those laws need to be overcome Engels is speaking of appropriating them as if they were transhistorical uh natural laws i'll just repeat the sentence again just for the sake of it <clears throat> quote the laws of his own social action hitherto standing face to face with man as laws of nature foreign to and dominating him will then be used with full understanding and so be mastered by him, end quote. So they appear as laws of nature, but it seems like he's also saying they are laws of nature that just need to be appropriated and controlled by him. Um, um, yeah, that's in, I don't know. That seems like a very uh, important statement. But that's not what this essay is about. That was just a thought. Such a control over social forces that govern human existence would at last usher the realm of freedom. Social domination is not limited to the state. Engels saw the capitalist market competition as another subjugating force. In the same text, Engels criticized Dering's idea of a federation of economic communes in which market competition between those communes conditioned upon the freedom of movement of people between different communes was preserved. During distinguish this from the cooperative ownership of the workers' association, which he believed, quote, would not exclude material competition and even the exploitation of wage labor, end quote. In a discussion that resembles a critique of market socialism, Engels argued that during scheme preserved effective competition between different communes so that, quote, things are removed from the sphere of competition, but men remain subject to it, end quote. Engels. In his introduction to, the, to Marx's The Civil War in France in 1891, Engels interpreted the shortcomings and confusions of the commune in terms of its political and economic characters, respectively based on the dominance character, based respectively on the dominance of Proudhonism and Blancism among the French working class. Engels stated, for example, that with the exception of associations in large industries, Proudhonian saw associations as, quote, sterile, even harmful, because it was a fetter on the freedom of the worker, end quote. But since by the time of the Commune there was a massive shift towards large-scale industries in France, quote, by far the most important decree of the Commune instituted the commune instituted, excuse me, by far the most important decree of the commune instituted an organization of large-scale industry and even of manufacture, which was not only to be based on the association of workers in each factory, but also to combine all these associations in one great union, in short, an organization which, as Marx quite rightly says in the Civil War, must necessarily have led, in the end, to communism, that is to say, the direct opposite of the Proudhon doctrine, end quote. Marx rejects Blancist revolutionary strategy based on small, highly disciplined groups of men organized in strictly centralized groups, quote, not only to seize the helm of state, but also by a display of great ruthless energy to maintain power until they succeed in sweeping the mass of the people into the revolution and ranging them around the small band of leaders, end quote. Engels. Engels argued that this profoundly contradicts the political form of society envisioned by the commune. Quote, in all its proclamations to the French in the provinces, it's a, it appealed to them to form a free. Quote, in all its proclamations to the French in the provinces, it appealed to them to form a free federation of all French communes with Paris, a national organization which, for the first time, was really to be created by the nation itself. It was precisely the oppressing power of the former 
centralized government, army, political police, bureaucracy, which Napoleon had created in 1798, and which since then had been taken over by every new government as a welcome instrument and used against its opponents. It was precisely this power which was to fall everywhere, just as it had already fallen in Paris, end quote. Engels. Hence, by drawing attention to the contradictions between the actual requirements of the movement and the formal orientations of these two ideologies, Engels highlighted the natural tendency of an emancipatory movement, such as the commune, towards coordinated associations at all productive levels to freely manage the society. Engels went on to make sense of the radical measures that the commune took, such as recallability as a way, quote, not to lose against its only just conquered supremacy, end quote, by subverting the measures that were used to undermine their power. The commune took the recallability and capping wages in order to disrupt the historical transformation of the state and the state's organs, quote, from servants of society into masters of society, end quote. In opposition to the, quote, superstitious belief, end quote, common among Germans regarding the state as the, quote, realization of the idea, end quote, or the, quote, excuse me, in opposition to the, quote, superstitious belief, end quote, common among Germans regarding the state as the, quote, realization of the idea, end quote, or the kingdom of God on earth, end quote, Engels argued that, quote, the state is nothing but a machine for the oppression of one class by another, and indeed in the democratic republic, no less than in the monarchy, at best an evil inherited from by the proletariat, after the proletariat's victorious struggle for class supremacy, whose worst sides the victorious proletariat, just like the commune, cannot avoid having to lop off at once as much as possible until such time as a generation reared in new, free social conditions is able to throw the entire lumber of the state on the scrap heap, end quote. Engels. In this sense, Engels saw the notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat exemplified in the Paris Commune. Engels distinguished such self-government from various co-determination schemes. He wrote a critique on the draft of the Erfurt program, which was to replace the Gotha program as the core program of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. While raising, while raising caution in presenting details regarding the exact form of the self-governing structure in a short document such as the Erfurt program, Engels recommended adding the following point, quote, complete self-government in the provinces, districts, and communes through officials elected by universal suffrage, the abolition of all local and provincial authorities appointed by the state, end quote. Footnote, Friedrich Engels, a critique of the draft Social Democratic Program of 1891. Regarding the question of regulation of industries, he said against co-determination type models that, quote, we would be taken in good and proper by labor chambers made up half of workers and half of entrepreneurs. For years to come, the entrepreneurs would always have a majority. For only a single black sheep among the workers would be needed to achieve this. If it is not agreed upon that in cases of conflict both halves express separate opinions, independent chamber of workers. End quote. Engels share the key elements of Marx's understanding of quote, workers' control end quote, and push them forward in his writings during and after Marx's death. Engels' thoughts were surely affected, but not hampered by the significant developments in the socialist movement in Germany and internationally, especially after the relaxation of the anti-socialist laws in Germany and the founding of the Second International. 
Nevertheless, Engels remained committed to the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote, as the key pillar of an emancipatory socialist vision. William Morris, 1834 to 1896. Morris was one of the earliest British Marxists who, with the support of Engels, co-founded the Socialist League in 1885 after his break from the Social Democratic Federation. Footnote. The question as to whether William Morris should be considered as a, quote, Marxist, end quote, is rather contentious. E. P. Thompson, such as in E.P. Thompson's William Morris, From Romantic to Revolutionary, G. D. H. Cole, Socialist Thought, Marxism and Anarchism, 1850-1890, Florence Boos and William Boos, The Utopian Communism of William Morris, The History of Political Thought, uh, Volume 7, Number not, not, excuse me, Number 3, 1986, Given the broad scope of Marxism adapted in this chapter that includes libertarian interpretations, we can safely categorize Morris under this banner. And footnote. Before the clashes with the founder of the Social Democratic Federation, Henry Hindman, Morris co-authored a piece with him called A Summary of the Principal Socialism in 1884. Perhaps under the influence of Hindman, the state played a more central role in this piece than in the later writings of Morris. Seemingly equating the state with the people as a whole, they called for, quote, the immediate management and ownership of the railways by the state so that in land communications of the country, it may be under the control of the people at large and carried on for their benefit, regard being had to the full remuneration of the labor of all who are engaged in the work of transport, end quote. This, however, remains uncritical of the limits of nationalization and the actual content of the purported, quote, control, end quote, by, quote, the people, end quote. In the Manifesto of the Socialist League, published in 1885, Morris and his co-author, E. Belford Bax, wrote that, quote, the workers, although they produce all the wealth of society, have no control over its production or distribution, end quote. Footnote. William Morris and E. Belfort Bax, The Manifesto of the Socialist League, reproduced in Reisman, Democratic Socialism, Socialism in Britain. Text in Economic and Political Thought, 1825 to 1952. One second. Mm -hmm. I want to take note of this uh, piece. I want to see if there's anything cool in there for me to read. Um, Democratic Socialism in Britain. Can't find it. Oh well. Um, what should I do? Oh, okay. Where am I?
The program condemned both nationalization and state socialism, quote, whose aim it would be to make concessions to the working class while leaving the present system of capital and wages still in operation, end quote. In the second edition of the manifesto, Morris weighed on the need for the socialists to gain political power, not in the sense of, quote, exercise of the franchise or even the fullest development of representative system, end quote, but a, quote, direct control by the people of the whole administration of the community, whatever the ultimate destiny of that administration is to be, end quote. He believed that the practical steps towards communism would create the opportunity to establish, quote, the decentralized voluntary organization of production. In Socialism from the Root Up, 1888, Morris envisioned the future social organization whose political aspect comprises, quote, an organized body of communities, each carrying on its own affairs, but unified by a delegated federal body whose function would be the guardianship of the acknowledged principles of society, end quote. Footnote. William Morris Socialism from the Root Up in Political Writings, Contributions to Justice and Commonwealth, 1883-1890, to edited by Nicholas Salmon, published in 1994. End footnote. One of the most intriguing expressions of the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote, in Morris is found in his critique of Edward Bellamy's extremely popular book, Looking Backward, published in 1888. Morris criticized Bellamy's vision of a socialist society that was, quote, satisfied with modern civilization, end quote, under centralized state control. This is why Bellamy had to, quote, put forward his scheme of the organization of life, which is organized with a vengeance. His scheme may be described as state communism, worked by the very extreme of national centralization, end quote. Morris believed such that such an overarching state is alienating for the individual. Instead, quote, it will be necessary for the unit of administration to be small enough for every citizen to feel himself responsible for its details and be interested in them, bracket or in, end bracket, the individual, that man cannot shuffle off the business of life onto the shoulders of an abstraction called the state but must deal with it in conscious association with each other, end quote. For Morris, the aim of communism is as much to nurture, quote, variety of life, end quote, as to facilitate the equality of conditions in order to bring about the realm of freedom. I gotta take a break. Paul Lafargue, 1842 to 1911. Lafargue, the co founder of the Federated Socialist Workers' Party of France in 1880, was one of the earliest Marxist theoreticians in France and Spain who played a key role in reshaping the French workers' movement after the Commune. In Socialism and Nationalization, published in 1882, Lafargue called nationalization of certain industries, quote, socialism for the capitalist, end quote, marking, quote, the last form of capitalist exploration, end quote. Footnote. Paul Lafargue, Socialism and Nationalization, Socialist Standard, February 1912. Um... I believe Socialist Standard is the paper of the Socialist Party of Great Britain. Um, who which is who uh, Adam Buick is affiliated with. And footnote. Lafarge gave the example of nationalization some in, of some industries, such as electric, telegraph, or the press, as a way to keep the sector profitable for the speculators while maintaining control over the industries in the hands of the capitalists. Lafarge remarked that, quote, 
In capitalist society, a private industry only becomes a state service in order to better serve the interests of the bourgeoisie. Dot, dot, dot. The state, by centralizing administration, lessens the general changes, excuse me, lessens the general charges. It runs the service at a smaller cost. End quote. Lafargue believed that nationalization would open up the state to corruption. As for whether such measures would simplify the process of expropriation for the Workers' Party, Lafargue argued that the danger would by far outweigh the advantages. Although the first revolutionary act, according to Lafargue, must be to seize the central power as the precondition for the Workers' Party to begin the process of economic expropriation, mm -hmm. Quote, those who busy themselves with state socialism, that is to say, those who demand the nationalization or municipalization of certain services, do not trouble at all about the lot of the workers engaged in those services, dot, dot, dot. The workshops of the state and municipality are prisons quite as bad as private workshops, if not worse, dot, dot, dot. They are bent beneath an authority that is more powerfully hierarchic they can neither combine nor strike, end quote. After a period of revolutionary transition, during which the workers' government would increase its administrative and economic capacity, quote, with the needs of consumption and the powers of production scientifically calculated, consumption as well as production will be free, end quote. In our goal, 1889, Lafarge conceived of the solution to the, quote, situation created by capitalist centralization, end quote, in the socialist demand that, quote, all the centralized labor instruments such as railroads, factories, textiles, works, excuse me, textile works, mines, large farming properties, banks, etc., become national property and be given over to the associated workers who will operate them with a current line current laying with excuse me with a contract laying out conditions not for the profit of a few capitalists do nothing as in thieves but for the profit of the entire nation end quote lafargue in our goal eighteen eighty nine The emphasis on the transfer of the means of production to the associated producers is the key difference between this demand and that of state socialism. In other words, quote, if the industry is already taken over by the state, dot, 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 don't fulfill the socialist ideal, it's because they aren't run by the associated workers in the interest of the nation, but by functionaries in a budgetary interest, end quote. Lafargue. Jules Ged. Make sure I'm pronouncing that right. I listened to it earlier, but... Jules Ged. Jules Ged. Look at that. Jules Ged, 1845 to 1922. Ged, a key figure in the early propagation of Marxism in France, met with Marx in London in 1880 and drafted the program of the French Workers' Party. The preamble, which according to Engels was dictated to Ged, distinguished between private and collective properties and argued that private property was increasingly eliminated by industrial progress, as collective property was further constituted by the very development of capitalism. However, the collective appropriation could only come about by the revolution acting, revolutionary action of the proletariat, quote, organized in a distinct political party, end quote. Footnote. Jules Ged and Karl Marx, the program of the Parti Ouvrier. Jules Ged Internet Archive, Marxist.org. This is the full translation of the program, and in important ways it is different from the translation of the preamble that is provided in the Marx Engels Collected Work, Volume 24. Ed foot, end footnote. The preamble further recognized that the movement for the emancipation of the working class must aim at, quote, the political and economic expropriation of the capitalist class and return to community of all the means 
We return to the community all of the means of production, end quote. In, politi in the political section, the program demanded, quote, the commune to be master of its administration and its policing, end quote. In the economic section, it demanded, quote, prohibition of all interference by employers in the administration of workers' friendly societies, provident societies, etc., which are returned to the exclusive control of the workers, end quote. Ged wrote in The Social Problem and Its Solution in 1905 that, quote, it is only collectively that the workers comprising the entire nation can and ought to possess the means of wealth, mines, railways, canals, factories, etc., socially operated. Capitalist evolution itself supplies the necessary elements, material and intellectual, of this appropriation and of this production by and for society now become a vast cooperative commonwealth, end quote. Ged. Ged emphasized the role of the state in this process, albeit not in its repressive form, arguing that, quote, this economic expropriation, which would allow the expropriated full participation in the, the benefits accruing from social appropriation, must be preceded by a political expropriation, the establishment of the socialist republic being only realizable by a proletariat master of the state, proletarian master of the state, and acting in conformity with the law, since it itself will be and make the law. End quote. However, the question as to whether this, quote, proletariat master of the state, end quote, indicates the class origin of the state administrators of the fundamental character of the administrative structure is unclear. Daniel de Leon, 1852 to 1914. De Leon was already a Marxist before joining the Socialist Labor Party of America, SLP, in 1890. Writing soon after the SLP's break from the Knights of Labor <clears throat> and the formation of the Socialist Trade and Labor Alliance in 1895, De Leon defined socialism in Reformer Revolution, published in 1896, on the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, abolition of the wage system, and the end of class society in which the state in its repressive form has withered away. However, de Leon emphasized the importance of the coordinating role of the state without which no harmony can be achieved. Without going into its organizational structure, de Leon argued that, quote, the society needs this central directing authority, end quote. So the, quote, cooperative commonwealth, end quote, with all its divisions of labor can work harmoniously. De Leon clearly distanced himself from the anti-political left by emphasizing that the economic and political issues and struggles cannot be separated and must be simultaneously tackled. De Leon's position began to shift towards industrial unionism from 1904 onwards. In The Burning Question of Trade Unionism, published in 1904, De Leon saw some truth in both pro- and anti-union positions, but criticized both for failing to understand the transformative potential of unions because unions limit their vision mm -hmm. to the present form of, excuse me, because they, these positions, limit their vision to the present form of unions. De Leon instead advocated for industrial unionism. De Leon extended this criticism, excuse me, his criticism to the socialist strategy towards unions by arguing that, quote, unless the political aspect of the labor movement is grasped, socialism will never triumph, and that unless its trade union aspect is grasped, the day of its triumph will be the day of its defeat, end quote. De Leon, The Burning Question of Trade Unionism. For de Leon, it was in the political aspect of unionism that the spell of revolution lay. Yeah. 
His involvement with the founding of the Industrial Workers of the World, albeit tenuous, radicalized his political view on the role of the Industrial Union. His anti-state stance became more pronounced in Socialist Reconstruction of Society, published in 1905. Quote, Capitalist society requires the political state, accordingly its economics translate themselves into political tenets. Socialist society, on the contrary, knows nothing of the political state. In socialist society, the political state is a thing of the past, either withered out of existence by disuse or amputated according to as circumstances may dictate, end quote. De Leon. Socialist Reconstruction of Society, the Industrial Vote. De Leon linked what with De Leon linked that with the emergence of the industrial organization of the working class, both as the economic foundation of the future society and the political movement to hallow out the state. Therefore, De Leon identified the goal of the method of political struggle at the ballot as a, quote, purely destructive, end quote, weapon. Footnote. De Leon ran unsuccessfully for public office several times in the 1890s and 1900s. End footnote. In Industrialism, published in 1906, De Leon argued that socialism is not the simple overthrow of private ownership and its replacement with public or state ownership. Socialism is that social system under which the necessaries of production are owned, controlled, and administered by the people, for the people, and under which, accordingly, the cause of political and economic despotism have been abolished, class rule is at the end, end quote. Daniel de Leon, Industrialism, in Industrial Unionism, Selected Editorial, end footnote. Accordingly, industrialism is an economic organization of the whole of the working class under one big union. The idea of workers' control in the trajectory of de Leon's thought was quite akin to the syndicalist notions. However, de Leon insisted on distinguishing the position of industrial unionism from syndicalist inclination towards direct action and frontal attack against the state, which he thought was very particular to the European context. Footnote, Daniel de Leon, Syndicalism, Industrial Unionism, Selected Editorial. And footnote, the goal of industrial unionism was, quote, the substitution of the political state with the industrial government, end quote, aiming at, quote, a democratically centralized government accompanied by the democratically requisite, quote, local self-rule, end quote, end quote. De Leon, Industrial Unionism. Therefore, Industrial Unionism grasped the chief principle of the government to be, quote, the central and local administrative authorities of the productive capacities of the people, end quote. Karl Kautsky, 1854 to 1938. Karl Kautsky was the leading Marxist theorist of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. In State Socialism, published in 1881, and The Abolition of the State, published in 1881, Kautsky argued that even though it might seem that the precondition for the emancipation of the proletariat is the abolition of the state, the proletariat needed the power of the state to preserve the proletariat's class rule by disintegrating the other classes. Kautsky concluded by saying that, quote, the abolition of the government and the state are not the first act of the proletariat revolution, but the last consequence of this, end quote. Kautsky, Die Abschaffung des Staats, 
Der Sozialdemokrat, number 51, published in 1881, translation by Noah Rodman, available at Libcom. Therefore, the task of the proletariat, quote, was not to destroy but to conquer the state. The next goal of the proletariat consists of becoming the ruling class. Everything else must be subordinated to this purpose, end quote. The abolition of the state. Kautsky. Therefore, the task of the proletariat... Excuse me. In The Free Society, published in 1882, Kautsky's vision had a pronouncedly nationalistic angle. Kautsky noted that, quote, not the prosperity of the individual, not the prosperity of the commune, the prosperity of the nation will be the highest goal of the free society to which everything else has to submit itself, end quote. Kautsky, The Free Society, available at Marxist.org. Regarding the structure of such free society, Kautsky said that it, quote, will be a federation of nations and not of groups or communes, whose production will be left neither to free choice nor to the spontaneous formation of groups, nor even to sheer force of social attraction. Instead, production will be placed under the direction of a well-organized administration, end quote. Kautsky, the Free Society. Kautsky was one of the leading architects of the Erfurt program, along with Edward Bernstein and August Babel. In a book entitled Class Struggle, published in 1892, Kautsky elaborated on the Erfurt program. Kautsky recognized the state as having the requisite dimensions of the establishment of the, quote, socialist or cooperative commonwealth, end quote, which coexisted with the nation. End quote. Shit. No, not end quote, sorry. Kautsky envisioned a society in which the means of production in large industries, which are generally compatible with cooperative production, are owned by the state while leaving the small-scale production in the realm of private ownership. Kautsky's vision of a socialist society in this writing shows profound incompatibilities with the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote. Kautsky stated that, quote, It is true that socialist production is irreconcilable with the full freedom of labor, that is, with the freedom of the laborer to work when, where, and how he wills, but this freedom of labor is irreconcilable with any systematic cooperative form of labor, whether the form be capitalist or socialist, end quote. Kautsky, Class Struggle, Erfurt Program. Finally, in such a socialist society, quote, where all the means of production are in a single hand, there is but one employer, bracket, end, and bracket to change bracket jobs and bracket is impossible. End quote. Kautsky, Class Struggle Effort Program. In On the Day After the Social Revolution, published in 1902, Kautsky delved into some of the issues that might arise shortly after the outbreak of the revolution. Regarding the process of expropriation, Kautsky did not rule out the possibility of capitalists selling their enterprises directly to the workers who worked there so that they could operate them cooperatively. But Kautsky also suggested that, quote, capital would find its most extensive and generous purchaser in the state and municipalities, and for this very reason, the majority of the industries could pass into the possession of the states and municipalities, end quote. Kautsky. The Social Revolution, translated by A.M. and May Wood Simon. Furthermore, regarding the question of how to keep the workers, quote, sue me, 
how to keep the workers in, quote, labor, end quote, after the revolution, he relied on a, quote, democratic discipline, end quote, of the kind that a union uses during a strike. Kautsky preserved a level of variation with respect to the organization of labor in different industries. In industries such as rail, the railways, quote, the democratic organization can be formed that laborers choose delegates who will constitute a sort of parliament, which will fix the conditions of labor and control for government of the bureaucratic machinery. Other industries can be given over to the direction of the unions, and others again can be op operated cooperatively. End quote. Kautsky, the Social Revolution. Furthermore, Kautsky emphasized the impossibility of the abolition of money and wages. James Connolly. 1868 to 1916. Connolly, one of the founding members of the Irish Socialist Republican Party, was keenly aware of the importance of, quote, workers' control, end quote, within socialism. In a remarkable passage, Connolly argued in State Monopoly versus Socialism, published in 1899, that, quote, socialism properly implies, above all things, the cooperative control by the workers of the machinery of production. Without this cooperative control, the public ownership by the state is not socialism, it is only state capitalism, end quote. Connolly separated ownership from controls and argued that, quote, the ownership of by the state of all the land and materials for labor combined with the cooperative control by the workers of such land and materials would be socialism, end quote. Connolly, State Monopoly versus Socialism. In Parliamentary Democracy, published in 1900, Connolly contrasted the parliamentary democracy under capitalism, with merely, which merely gives workers the right to choose their masters with the socialist society, in which, quote, the freedom of the revolutionist will change the choice of rulers, which we have today, into the choice of administrators of laws voted upon directly by the people and will also substitute for the choice of masters, capitalists, the appointment of reliable public servants under direct public control. That will mean true democracy, the industrial democracy of the socialist republic. End quote. Connolly, Parliamentary Democracy. The Workers' Republic, Volume 4, Number 5, 22nd of September, 1900. After his clashes with E.W. Stewart over trade union and electoral strategies of the ISRP and emigration to the United States in 1904, Connolly founded the Irish Socialist Federation in New York in 1907. By this time, Connolly's thoughts were deeply influenced by his involvement with the IWW. Connolly declared the neutrality of the international, excuse me, the Irish Socialist Federation. Sorry, I'm just having like a kind of like a, whenever I see I in like a, what's it, um, an acronym, um, I always assume for some reason just the, just because it's so often in uh, socialist uh, history uh, been used to mean international uh, that uh, I just, I guess I just uh, need to said, of course, assumed it was international, but it's Irish. Connolly declared the neutrality of the Irish Socialist Federation towards existing political parties while continuing the revolutionary fight at the economic level through the or economic organization of the industrial workers of the world. Connolly advocated for the formation of a new political party of the workers by the international working, excuse me, industrial workers of the world to unify the revolutionary socialist forces. Footnote. Connolly, A Political Party of the Workers, The Harp, Volume 1, Number 1, 1908. Similar to De Leon, Connolly argued that the, quote, 
political institutions are not adapted to the administration of industry, and the industrial organizations are adapted to the administration of a cooperative commonwealth that we are working for, end quote. Instead of the territorially based political institutions that compose the coercive forces of capital, quote, the workers in the shops and factories will organize themselves into unions, each union comprising all the workers at a given industry. That said, the union will democratically control the workshop life of its own industry, electing all foremen, etc., and regulating the routine of labor in that industry in coordinate, excuse me, in subordination to the needs of society in general. End quote. Connolly, Socialism Made Easy. Hence for Connolly, the structure of the new society necessarily begins in the workshops and outwardly, excuse me, upwardly cascades to the rest of the industrial organization until, quote, it reaches the culminating point of national executive power and direction, end quote. Connolly, Socialism Made Easy. The top level would be, quote, administered, end quote, by, quote, a committee of experts elected from industries and professions of the lands, end quote. Socialism made easy. This conception of socialism, quote, destroys at one blow all the fears of a bureaucratic state ruling and ordering the lives of every individual from above and thus gives assurance that the social order of the future will be an extension of the freedom of the individual and not the suppression of it. In short, it blends the fullest democratic control with the most absolute expert supervision. End quote. Connolly. Socialism made easy. Although his ideas like those of De Leon came close to syndicalism, De, uh, Connolly insisted in Political Action, published in 1908, that industrial organizations should coexist with a pluralist socialist party that embraced, quote, all shades and conceptions of socialist political thought, end quote. Connolly further clarified his conception of socialist political parties, where he defined two types of socialist parties. One socialist party made up of purely revolutionary individuals with clear ideological orientation and understanding of the economics of capital, and another whose primary role is to educate and direct the class consciousness towards the revolutionary line. Connolly believed that even though the second type can risk can run excuse me, the second type ran the risk of confusion, the first had a tendency towards quote dictation and despotism, end quote, that sought to quote purify its ranks by expulsion, end quote. Vladimir Lenin, 1870 to 1924. It is difficult to talk positively about the ideas of Lenin in this period regarding notions of workers' control, even though in draft and explanation of a program of Social Democratic Party, 1895 to 1896, Lenin echoed Marx in the quote, in that quote, the emancipation of the workers must be the act of the working class itself, end quote. Most of his writings in this period carried a rather patronizing view of the working class. In one of his most famous writings, What is to be Done, written or published in 1902, Lenin expressed some of his most troubling statements about the revolutionary potential of the working class. Lenin wrote that, quote, There could not have been social democratic consciousness among the workers, 
it would have to be brought to them from without. The history of all countries shows that the working class, exclusively by its own effort, is able to develop only trade union consciousness, dot, dot, dot. The theory of socialism, however, grew out of the philosophical, historical, and economic theories elaborated by educated representatives of the propertied classes by intellectuals, end quote, Lenin. Against the spontaneous actions of the masses, Lenin argued that such a movement, quote, leads to its subordination to bourgeois ideology, dot, 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 for the spontaneous working class movement is trade unionism, dot, 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 and trade unionism means the ideological enslavement of the workers by the bourgeoisie, end quote. Lenin, what is to be done? Footnote. Later in the same document, Lenin elaborated on this idea with regard to class political consciousness, saying it, quote, can be brought to the workers only from without, that is, only from outside the economic struggle, from outside the sphere of relations between workers and employers, end quote. End footnote. Lenin's intention was not to undermine mass movement as such, but to define the immediate task in the present of such movement, not in terms of, quote, bowing down to the spontaneity of this movement, i.e. reducing the role of the social democracy to mere subservience to the working class movement as such, end quote. What is to be done? Instead, Lenin considered such mass movements at any given time to present the party with new theoretical, political, and organizational tasks to grapple with. Only through the activities of social democracy, whose task was to enter among the masses as, quote, theoreticians, as propagandists, as agitators, and as organizers, end quote, and whose relation to the economic struggle of the working class was one of, quote, executive groups, end quote, that we could ensure, quote, the stability of the movement as a whole and carry out the aims both of social democracy and of trade unions proper, end quote. What is to be done? On the other hand, if we, quote, begin with a broad workers' organization, which is supposedly most, quote, accessible, end quote, to the masses, dot, 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 we shall achieve neither the one aim nor the other, end quote. Lenin, what is to be done? In an article published in February 1905 entitled, Two tactics. Lenin maintains his criticism of the position that assumed a subordinate and pliable position of the party to the movement. Lenin held that, quote, it was in the name of independent activity of the proletariat that the, quote, organization as process, end quote, theory was invented. A theory that justified disorganization and glorified the anarchism of the intellectuals, end quote. Lenin, two tactics. Lenin distinguished between two types of independent activity of the proletariat. One type of in independent activity that, quote, possessed of revolutionary initiative, end quote, and another that, quote, is undeveloped and is held in leading strings, end quote. Lenin, two tactics. In June of that year, Lenin published a new revolutionary workers association in 1905. 1905 being the year, in which Lenin analyzed the impact of the Russian Liberation Union. The Russian Liberation Union sought to organize militia to overthrow the autocracy and establish a constitutional assembly whose structure would consist only of, quote, groups of workers, mainly from one in the same workshop, two factory councils, three district meetings, and four committees of the workers' union, end quote. Lenin a new revolutionary workers' association. Lenin believed that, quote, by fighting for freedom with close connection with the proletarian struggle for socialism, end quote, such independent non-party organizations could, quote, play a role that objectively amounts to promoting the interest of the bourgeoisie, end quote. 
Lenin, a new revolutionary workers' association. Similarly, in Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution, 1905, Lenin called the Social Revolutionary Parties, the SRs, use of the term, quote, revolutionary communes, and quote, revolutionary phrase-mongering since the use of the term revolutionary communes disguises the errors and shortcomings of an experience, possibly the Paris Commune in the distant past. Lenin's issue with the use of the term, as by the SR, Socialist Revolutionary, was that it was party was that it restricted its role to spreading the insurrection. However, Lenin insisted that such a revolutionary government would have other concrete administrative work to conduct, including a series of reforms. Perhaps some of the most positive accounts by Lenin regarding, quote, workers' control, end quote, can be found in his writings in the immediate aftermath of the 1905 revolution. As Lenin contemplated on the events of the 1905 revolution in Russia, Lenin began to express more favorable statements about the political role of the Soviets and showed new directions in his thinking about the revolutionary potential of the working class. In our Tasks and the Soviet of Workers' Deputies, published in 1905, Lenin addressed the question of, quote, how to divide and how to combine the tasks of the Soviet and those of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, end quote. Lenin, Our Tasks and the Soviet of Workers' Deputies. Lenin argued that since the Soviet emerged as the result of the general strike, which itself had both economic and political dimensions, the economic struggles could still be carried forward under a broad umbrella of political parties. With regard to the political dimension of the Soviet, Lenin believed that it, quote, should be regarded as the embryo of a provisional revolutionary government, end quote and that it, quote, should proclaim itself the provisional revolutionary government of the whole of Russia as early as possible, or should set up a provisional revolutionary government, end quote. Lenin. Our tasks in the Soviet of Workers' Deputies. More than making a fundamental change in Lenin's view on the revolutionary capacities of the working class itself, it was meant to serve as a strategic appeal to meet the dire need for the formation of a political center of gravity, sufficiently deep-rooted within the masses, including the soldiers, the peasants, and the intelligentsia. In the Lessons of the Commune, 1908, Lenin reassessed the legacy of the Commune, quote, as a splendid example of the unanimity with which the proletariat was able to accomplish the democratic tasks which the bourgeoisie could only proclaim, end quote. Lenin, Lessons of the Commune, 1908. Lenin praised the Commune's action, saying that, quote, without any particularly complex legislation, in a simple, straightforward manner, the proletariat which had seized power carried out the democratization of the social system, abolished the bureaucracy, and made all official posts elective, end quote. Lenin, Lessons of the Commune. The Commune's mistakes, according to Lenin, were that it did not seize the money capital from the banks and wage frontal assaults on Versailles. Rosa Luxemburg, 1871-1919 Much of Luxemburg's political writings in this period is dedicated to a perceptive dissection of revolutionary actions. Furthermore, Luxemburg's characterization of capitalism as fundamentally anarchic limited her vision of radical possibilities of economic organization under socialism. Nevertheless, Luxembourg always remained perceptively critical of various hurdles in the way of creative expression of the masses. Therefore, what we can get from Luxembourg's thought in this period is not so much the specificities of the idea of, quote, workers' control, end quote, but a political philosophy of revolutionary praxis firmly anchored on the spontaneous and creative potential of the masses and fiercely against any structure that would come in the way of such actions.
In Social Reform or Revolution, published in 1898, Luxembourg acknowledged the significance of trade unions and parliamentary struggles to raise awareness and consciousness of the proletariat and organize the proletariat into a class. Excuse me. However, Luxembourg cautioned that, quote, if they are considered as instruments for the direct socialization of the capitalist economy, they lose not only their supposed effectiveness, but also cease to be a means of preparing the working class for the proletarian conquest of power, end quote. Luxembourg, Social Reform or Revolution. Luxembourg believed that achieving socialism through, quote, an unbroken chain of continually growing reforms, end quote, is a fantasy. Social Re Luxembourg, social reform or revolution. Rather than automatically emerging out of the daily struggles of the working class, socialism is, quote, the consequence of only the ever-growing contradictions of capitalist economy and the comprehension by the working class of the unavoidability of the suppression of these contradictions through a social transformation, end quote. Luxembourg, Social Reform or Revolution. The essence of the revolutionary praxis is, quote, to recognize the direction of this development and then, in the political struggle, to push its consequences to the extreme, end quote. However, Luxembourg's dedication to the SPD's mass party politics also limited her vision in some respects. In an important piece on the organizational question of the Russian social democracy, Luxembourg renounced the model of political organization based on, quote, splintering complete autonomy and self-government for local organizations, end quote. Sorry, I gotta put some chapstick on. Excuse me. Luxembourg renounced the model of political organization based on, quote, splintering complete autonomy and self-government for local organizations, end quote, as, quote, the distinguishing feature of the burdensome and politically outmoded old organizational forms, end quote. Luxembourg, organizational questions of Russian social democracy. Instead, Luxembourg called for a centralized mass party whose distinguishing character from Blanca's centralism is that that centralized mass party carries the, quote, authoritative expression of the will of the conscious and militant vanguard of the workers vis-a-vis -vis the separated groups and individuals among them, end quote. Luxembourg, Organizational Questions of Russian Social Democracy. But particularly after the militant wave of strikes in 1905 and the Russian Revolution in that year, Luxembourg paid a lot of attention to the creative potential of spontaneous movements. In Mass Action, published in 1911, Luxembourg repeated her criticism of a party structure whose centralized form rested on a small party executive. Instead, Luxembourg argued that, quote, every step forward in the struggle for emancipation of the working class must at the same time mean a growing intellectual independence of the working class's mass, the working class's growing self-activity, self-determination, and initiative, end quote. Luxembourg, Mass Action. Luxembourg saw the historical essence of the proletarian struggle in, quote, the proletarian masses not needing, quote, leaders, end quote, in a bourgeois sense, that they are themselves leaders, end quote. Luxembourg. Mass action. That's a famous quote from, uh, I believe it was like a free sh free speech demonstration in like the Pacific Northwest somewhere, um, of the IWW. Um, they asked him who their leader was, and they said, "We're all leaders." In 
In the mass strike political party and trade union published in 1906, Luxembourg argued that social democracy and syndicalism both assume that the spontaneous will of the masses can be decided upon at will. On the contrary, she believed that this was a, quote, historical phenomenon which at a given moment could result from social conditions with historical inevitability, end quote. Luxembourg, the mass strike. Regarding the unforeseeable consequences of such spontaneous actions, she said that, quote, even the relations of the worker to the employer are turned around since the January general strike and the strikes of 1905, which followed upon it. The principle of the capitalist, quote, mastery of the house, end quote, is de facto abolished, end quote. Luxembourg, the mass strike. In fact, it is through apparently chaotic actions that, quote, a feverish working organization, end quote, emerges. Luxembourg, the mass strike political party and trade unions. Anton Panikuk, Panikuk, 1873 to 1960. Although Panikuk is known as one of the most prominent theorists of council communism, Panikuk's writing prior to 1917 have a significantly different tone, very much revolving around the left wing of the Social Democratic Party, albeit his with his characteristic creativities. In his Two Sorts of Reforms, published in 1908, Panikuk tried to carve out a third way between reformism and revolution by arguing for radical reformism as a revolutionary process. While empowering and radicalizing the workers, such radical reforms would prove unachievable within capitalism, making the need for a revolutionary transcendence evident. After achieving power, the working class must rapidly engage with the suppression of the cause of poverty through a socialization process by making the state machinery work in its interests. Panacook continued this line of argument in his Hope in the Future, published in 1912, where Panacook maintained that those radical reforms resisted by the bourgeoisie and those measures that they failed to implement would radicalize the working class into a peaceful and imperceptible passing of society to socialism, end quote. In response to Kautsky's criticism of the two, his two sorts of reforms, Panikuk clarified his position about the revolution further in Marxist theory and revolutionary tactics published in 1912 by defining it as a process. Footnote. Such a process-oriented approach to revolution continued to play a central role in his thinking after his turn to council communism after 1917. And footnote. In Socialism and Anarchism, published in 1913, Panikuk presented the layout of the revolutionary transformation from capitalism to socialism. None of the chief characteristics of different phases of this transformation clearly speaks to the idea of workers' control. Regarding the question of the state, the society would still require, quote, an effective economic and carefully planned system of production and the avoidance of all useless waste of material and labor power in one word, organization, end quote. Panikuk. Hope in the future. Oh, no. The footnote says this is from Hope in the Future. But it doesn't seem like it's lining up correct. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, in other words, the state, quote, becomes a corporate body with purely economic function, end quote. Therefore, the political system after the victory of the proletariat, quote, will be governed by the same principles which the workers now employed in their fighting organizations. Equality of rights for all members, expression of the will of the whole in legal provisions and resolutions which each must obey execution of the will of the majority by an executive, end quote. Anton Panikuk, Socialism and Anarchism. Panikuk contrasted the, his view with both parliamentary socialism and syndicalism in Socialism and Labor Unionism, published in 1913. 
the former considering the work of other labor organizations, such as unions, unnecessary. Socialism, or parliamentary socialism, and syndicalism, believing that the working class is always already revolutionary and dismissing the crucial role of the party. Contrary to industrial unionists, Panacook argued that the labor movement was revolutionary precisely insofar as the labor movement did not pursue revolutionary aims, but focused on the improving the working conditions and gathering the masses in great organizations. Remember that this is uh, this piece is only discussing um, uh, the notion of workers' control up to 1917. Or was it nineteen seventeen? Oh no. Yeah, I think it was nineteen seventeen. It might be up to the World War One though. I can't remember. I don't want to scroll back to the top of this uh, PDF to find out well, the exact year. But um, obviously, it's ex it's excluding Panacook's work in from um, this Council Communist period. The survey hot. This survey hot. Say so. We're done. Including remarks. The survey highlights a pattern in which the most prominent Marxist theorist of this period did not, in fact, have much to say about the notion of, quote, workers' control, end quote, as the more, quote, marginal, end quote, figures. A reason behind this is that much of the energy of the Marxist theorists in this period went into efforts to build lasting institutions to assert working class power and to fight the most egregious aspects of capitalism and the state through day-to-day -day struggles. In the background of these preoccupations was the general tendency among Marxists to push the discussion of the forms of future society into the, quote, day after the revolution, end quote. Therefore, contemplation on the notion of, quote, workers' control, end quote, seemed insignificant. This was in sharp contrast with the general tendency among anarchists and syndicalists to engage in prefigurative politics that sought to reflect the foundations of the future society in its transformative practices here and now. This is an important reason why some of the lesser-known Marxist figures, especially those who had closer affinity to anarchist and syndicalist thoughts, are accentuated in this essay, excuse me, in this survey. The unique contribution of Marx and Engels, though not without tensions with respect to some of his writings and his interpretations of Marx, Engels' interpretation of Marx, to this debate lies precisely in his staunch defense of those working class movements that sought to increase the political capacities of the working class, to carry out transformative processes, and in his fierce critique of their shortcomings in seeking those reforms as ends, while maintaining prefiguration as an essential part of the revolutionary process itself. The synthesis became clear to him after he encountered the experience of the Paris Commune and its prefigurative politics. The spirit behind his critique of the Gotha program regarding the tendency to postpone the abolition of the wage system, the capitalist market relations, and the capitalist form of the state to the day after the revolution rather than as part of the revolutionary program of the party is such understanding of the importance of prefigurative politics. Such synthesis overcomes the tendency in socialist movements, which all too often become a reality, to sacrifice self-emancipation for creating the institutions of working class power. The events following the German and Russian revolutions had profound effects on the theoretical understanding of, quote, workers' control, end quote, within Marxist thought. They showed clearly the revolution's demand for a radical understanding of, quote, workers' control, end quote, as the transformative basis of the future society. The thrust of these movements soon forced a major shift among the Marxist theoreticians. Profoundly different writings emerged from those experiences within the main canon of Marxism, at least for some time. Numerous articles, pamphlets, and books by Lenin, Kautsky, Luxembourg, Panacook, as well as Antonio Gramsci, Karl Korsch, Otto Rula, Ernst Dalming, excuse me, Ernst Dalmig, Max Adler, Otto Bauer, and Hermann Gorder. Directly engaged with the question of Soviets and councils in the process of revolutionary transformation. 
as the Russian Revolution began to lose some of its emancipatory potential in the face of harsh post-war realities, certain political decisions by the Bolshevik leadership, as well as the failure of revolutionary attempts in Central and Western Europe, a new trend in Marxist thinking formed what came to be known as, quote, left communism, end quote. It was within this tradition that much of the later writings on, quote, workers' control, end quote, took place. This notion resurfaced during different phases, most notably during the long, quote, 1960s, end quote, and again in the 21st century. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, there is once again room for rethinking and covering such traditions which lay the ground for an emancipatory form of communism in which socialism and democracy are seen as an inseparable unity. And that was... Sorry, let me go back to the beginning. For some reason, I want to say the guy's name before... Essay's over, so you can turn it off if you want to, but if you uh, want to hear the guy's name, it's... I thought it was a nice essay. Come on. Babak Amini. Yeah, and the period was from 1871 to 1917. The title of the essay being On the Notion of Workers' Control in Marx and Marxist, 1871 to 1917, a survey. So, thank you for listening.